Hello everyone and welcome to the March uh, 2022 Teleadvisors webinar, uh, kicking off our sixth year of webinars with this group. I'm Colin Simpson, the Ascolite Teleadvisors Network. For those people who aren't familiar with us, we are a community of practitioners of people working in the third space, funnily enough. Uh, including learning designers, academic developers, education technologists, and um, many people with a wide range of titles. Our webinar today is uh, obviously a special event, holding it at a special time. Has some very special guests, uh, Dr. Emily McIntosh and Dr. Diane Nutt. Um, and it is a third space moment. What is integrated practice and how can it enable positive change and support a career journey? I am now going to hand over to Dr. Emily McIntosh. Thank you, Colin. Um, hello, everybody. Good evening. Uh, good morning. It's so lovely to be here and thank you so much for inviting us to come and speak with you today. Um, it's It's been a long time getting to this moment um, and uh, we're delighted to be able to share with you some of the insights that uh, we have had on the journey to writing this book. So I'm really delighted to be joined today by my co-editor, Diane, who I absolutely love working with. We've been speaking about this subject for forever um, and it's so important to us and we have some perspectives to share with you today and to talk to you a little bit about how, how the book came to be. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about what is integrated practice and looking at third space as a concept. We are kind of aware that a lot of people here today are, are very familiar with Celia's work. We did have a, a wonderful visit from Celia Whitchurch earlier on, but she couldn't stay, unfortunately. Um, we're going to look at a discussion about positive change through third spaces working post pandemic. And then Guy's going to take us through some perspectives on career trajectories, which seems to be a, a really, really topical issue at the moment, looking at challenges and successes before bringing the session to a conclusion. So we actually had our book uh, contract accepted um, pre-COVID, um, but it's fair to say, I think, that there have been many third space moments over the last 10, 20 years since Celia has been writing about the third space. And for us, um, COVID uh, offered, I think, a another third space moment. And uh, in the discussions that Colin and Sally and Diana and I have had in the run up to this webinar, we've been thinking about what the third space is and debating the language uh, around it and how the third space has, for me, effectively expanded since Celia started talking about her work um, back in the, the late um, 2000s. Um, and for me, um, as I said to Colin very recently, it, it isn't defined uh, around job roles and structures. It's more around how we work and the way in which we work. And that's come through so strongly in the book, looking at, at um, practice. And so when Celia started talking about the third space, she talk, talked about blended practice, um, where she was talking specifically about um, the, the those that work um, in the hinterlands between the academic and the professional spaces in higher education. But I think the third space has expanded to accommodate dual and blended professionals, those that permanently oscillate, as, as, as one writer has said in recent years, between the academic and the professional, one foot in both camps if you will. It's now expanded, at least in the UK, um, to include those who have come into academia from industry and from practice-based backgrounds. Um, and we were thinking really, how does their identity lie and how do they affiliate and how do we support these individuals who do great work crossing lots of structural boundaries within the academy? And one of the, the fundamental premises of our book is to challenge the organising principles of universities, thinking about how we affiliate ourselves in a relational way as opposed to looking at structures and, and systems. We have a few questions to ask you today to help reflect on those things. So there have been a number of third space moments. For me, the, the third space is theoretical and it's philosophical, it's practical and it's applied. And I think I like looking at the, this idea of a Venn diagram to explore this, uh, these spaces um, in the plural, looking at, um, at the context that we have an increasingly globalised and marketised higher education sector, diversified 
higher education sector and looking at how can we embrace this post pandemic and make the most of these spaces and bringing the third space into the mainstream which is in fact what one of our chapter authors um, professor julie hall has argued very strongly for in her opening chapter so i've um, made this diagram from um, Celia's work back in 2009 before she published her two books um, looking at the the um, the dimensions of professional activity um, so as Nat Natalia has said before with um, her colleagues third spaces are complex collaboration champions and this um, diagram here just gives you a flavor of all the things that, that colleagues in this these spaces do so we're looking at the spaces that we occupy we have this ability to offer multiple understandings of the institution that we work in and the sector that we're part of we're able to accommodate ambiguity between professional and academic domains we're able to redefine modify professional spaces and boundaries undertaking complex collaboration, working around formal structures, and navigating that idea of super complexity, which is something Celia herself talked about um, in the past. And, and we were wondering, what's the impact, therefore, on colleagues' identity and belonging in a space that's so fluid and flexible? I'm also looking at the legitimacies that we hold. Of course, um, many of us have academic credentials um, and achieve credibility in academic debate and space, but we also challenge the status quo. We manage the duality of belonging and, and also not quite belonging to academic spaces and also to professional ones. And what about the knowledges that we create, embedding and integrating professional and academic knowledge and bringing the two together? As I said yesterday when I was talking to a colleague, it's about joining the dots. Undertaking research into institutional activity, we're very evidence-led, very research-informed. Creating interactive knowledge environments. Elite forms of professionals, as Celia said back then, um, who apply their expertise to complex individual tasks. And, you know, in short, working in this space is really not easy. So one of the things we've been talking about in terms of developing career trajectories for those living in this space, but also around supporting colleagues living in this space, is to try and forge your heads to think through what this has on um, what this has in terms of impact on our identity but it's also about the relationships that we build and nurture and that goes back to what i said before not really defining ourselves in terms of job roles and responsibilities but the way that we work and who we work with we enter and understand academic discourse and debate and we form alliances with key partners both within and outside of universities facilitating autonomy of, of colleagues facilitating development helping with the pipeline we construct professional networks uh, internally and externally and of course this is exactly what we're doing today so it's really exciting to try and explore what this looks like post pandemic so we have some key questions um, and uh, then we're going to um, go into the the breakout spaces thinking particularly about where we go from here um, are we perpetuating forced distinctions between academics and professionals um, we we have to say that the third space is not without its critics we are hugely aware of that and but we want to celebrate this fluidity of working and we believe particularly during covid those who are in the third space were integral to keeping um, the show on the road integral to applying their expertise in um, you know very rapidly and at pace in a in a permanently fluid and ever-changing environment we have been very clear in the book that we are not um, challenging academic and professional spheres they are legitimate in their own right but we do want to celebrate those that work across those boundaries and to provide legitimate supportive pathways to progression in a way that currently is not the case we want to ask about where do teleadvisors fit into this working space and how you see yourselves as core actors and key leaders we want to think about the policy position can we and should we revisit and redefine the spaces where people work in a higher education context responding to the challenges that we will continue to face post COVID-19 and looking at this idea of not usurping more traditional roles but looking at what complex collaboration really means in practice and how we can align this with applying the knowledge the legitimacies the spaces and the experience in practice and looking at interdisciplinarity and transdisciplinarity and should there be an emphasis that this space can and should happily coexist within and amongst other recognized spaces in the academy and so therefore how can we support it to survive what's the impact on university and, and sector-wide strategy 
what's the impact of our work on students and what's the impact of our work on academic practice and finally for me one of the the most important things is is this the antidote to silo working if we organize ourselves differently through affiliating ourselves through collaboration, collegiality, complex collaboration, in fact, and celebrate the fluidity of working, working across the institution, across the sector to join the dots. Might that be the antidote to silo working? Might that be the way that we can avoid groupthink and celebrate diversity of experience, perspective and expertise, particularly at a time when it is absolutely critical that we move towards equity, diversity and inclusion in the academy? So I'll leave those questions with you and we start to think about the first discussion. So I will hand over to Diane, who's immensely good at setting up these, these breakout spaces. Di, over to you. Uh, no pressure on that. Thanks, Em. Um, what we'd like you to do is, uh, I know that uh, many of you have done, um, participated in the teleadvisor sessions before, have uh, used the chat box primarily for conversations, but we thought it might be interesting to give you a chance to talk in small groups to explore some of the thinking that you're having in relation to third space. We've kind of thrown some of the thinking at you, and if you're familiar with it, that will be fine. If it's new to you, it's going to feel a bit kind of tricky to be thinking off the top of your head about it. So we thought it might be useful and interesting for you to talk to some colleagues in small rooms for a little while and we thought we'd give you a prompt question to give you some discussion focus uh, rather than ask you to think about all those questions that Emily raised that we think are relevant to the whole issue of third space working. So what we'd like you to think about is how we might enable positive change through third space working post pandemic and we want you to think about this from where you are. It's very easy, I think, to sometimes think, oh, we can fix universities this way, but we're all in different places in those universities. And I think it's where you are and how where you are could enable you to work in this third space way to enable positive change in this kind of current climate. Post pandemic, when lots of things changed, lots of things happened, we were involved in things that we might never have been before because of the nature of the crisis, if you like, and it's opened conversations and some doors, and it may be as started as on a possible way of thinking about the future. So basically, in a moment, Colin's going to help us work out how to all go into breakout rooms. <laughs> Apparently, uh, Collaborate Ultra has just changed its process for this. So this might be a fun moment. But when you go into your groups, there's going to be four or five of you in a group. Um, feel free to meet each other. But you've got about eight minutes, maybe 10, to think about how you might enable positive change through, can't say this, through third space working. So that's what you're thinking about. When you come back, Sally Kift is very kindly going to uh, manage you all to get those points out of you. So uh, we'll, in a moment, put you in those groups. But keep this question in mind. How might you enable positive change through third space working post-pandemic in your specific context and place? All right. So thank you, everyone. Um, Colin might need to give me a warning when we're about at time. Um, but thanks everyone for those conversations. So remember Di's instructions and, and I'm going to do what Di said. So I'm going to ask um, the people to speak from their various groups and we had up to 10 groups so we might not get to everyone with their one best idea or one key point to try and get through as many as possible. But everyone else should feel entirely free to enter things into the chat so that they can all be shared. So thank you for that. Um, I might just start with the group that I was in because I can call on someone by name then and then I'll, oh, Sarah, look, I'm with you. I think I was in group 10, but um, perhaps you were in group one. I don't know. Um, so James Dillon was going to be our spokesperson from group 10 and then I'll just um, ask randomly for anyone who's a spokesperson to say something. So James, could you let people know yes. the sorts of best idea that we had? Sure. So everyone can hear me now? Yes, thank you. Okay, great. Um, yeah, so to summarise, it was um, the best idea, I think, was a simple one based on working together based on ideas, not the old chart or uh, positional authority or um, where you sit in the, um, in the organisation, working together based on ideas and uh, but that, it's difficult to do when, if you're a professional. Uh, but there's so many opportunities now post pandemic. So yeah, it's freeing up a bit. It's going to be interesting. Oh, thank you for that. Um, so, Natalia, I saw you mentioned Group 4. Um, oh. Who was the, going to be the spokesperson from Group 4, Yvonne Henk or you? 
I, I can start. I can start, and then I um, and please think, and if one um, just join me, and if I'm if I miss anything. So enabling positive positive change. We talked about, uh, I guess, achieving the genuine collaboration that will um, enable us all to. Um, um, enable people to feel that they matter. So that's the, the kind of the notion of mattering and their contribution really is important. And everybody is leading from the position of expertise, as the previous speaker mentioned, not from organizational chat, not from the position or the scope of work, it's just from the genuine expertise. So everybody is respecting that expertise that um, each person has. And uh, we um, are going to, I guess, we need to be cautious um, about ambiguity that when we're inhabiting these spaces that may create and um, that combination of uh, being humble and that other people to guide us from the position of expertise. So it's really the genuine collaboration will enable us to reach that space, I suppose. Yvonne and Hank, anything I missed? All right, I'll take that silence as a sense, so thank you. So Em um, nominated Ray from Curtin, but Ray says she's actually in a physical spare shared space at the moment, so so we have to get someone else. Well, um, it was just else? me and Ray. It was just me okay. and Ray, so I'm, I'm afraid it will be me, if that's all right. Um, Thanks, so we. We discussed um, the, the the fragility of relationships, and um, I um, I was talking about some work of Cameron Smith and, and his colleagues in Canada who wrote some some uh, an article recently that that is, is cited in the book and is is absolutely fantastic. And we can provide a link. We talk about the 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 form of capital is the quality of the relationships that we have, and so what can we do in the future to strengthen the quality of the relationships with with noting that they're quite fragile. Um, and it's it's a very fragile form of capital. So what can we do to strengthen the, the networks, the relationships, the quality of those that we have um, in, in, in the academy? Um, and given that, um, that as Ray mentioned, uh, many of these roles have responsibility, but without authority. Um, so it, a, a key thing for career progression would be to ensure that these roles are bolstered um, in terms of the relationships uh, that they develop the responsibility they have and the authority that they hold in order to do this role well. Um, and I think, uh, thank you to Ray for sharing her perspective. It was really, really interesting. Thanks, Em. Um, I'm not sure who Pingo is, but may Pingo do something, please? Or Sarah? I don't know. I, I think I've just been dubbed in for that one. Um, that sounds good. That's okay. Um, we, we kind of discussed um, that thing of, of, of actually leveraging off the pandemic, that it's actually more positive now in the sense of being a educational designer of, of, of instead of being seen just as tech help, um, the relationships have been able to build and, and so we get much more of a sort of a collaborative approach to design work rather than just, you know, help me fix it. So that's, we were kind of looking at it as the positive way forward for that but also how how to sort of gain credibility because a lot of the times it's an us and them situation um between the academic and the and the professional team so it was sort of trying to sort of how to build in the relationship so it does become true collaboration no thank you so much um anyone else wanted to jump in because i don't think i've no ads people have stopped dobbing others in now so you have to rely Dead on, on that Sorry, I was typing at the same time. I'll type afterwards. Yeah, thanks, Colin. Um, yeah, we talked about um, how in some contexts uh, there was um, uh, uh, a nice fluidity of practice, but on the other hand, that sometimes led to a, a fuzziness of identity with people not really being sure where they where they sat. Um, and then uh, um, uh, we talked as well, we decided to uh, get rid of the, the post-pandemic aspect of it uh, because uh, we thought that uh, uh, a that the pandemic is not over so we're not in post-pandemic yet and, and b that these are still more general um, uh, preoccupations uh, and then we, we looked at the um, uh, the leadership aspect and a couple of examples um, where um, once the, 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 the governance had um, embraced this idea of uh, uh, of facilitating third space that uh, there were actually some quite successful uh, but very different examples so to put that in one sentence um, and i hope 
the other two members of the, my, of our group agree with me. Um, I formulated it as get the governance on board to take a strategic approach, to facilitating and recognizing third space working. Brilliant. That's very good. And Colin endorses Thanks, that Colin. heartily. Um, if, does anyone else, we've only got a couple of minutes left. Did someone else want to say something from one of their groups? Otherwise, I'll ask Di, who was going to peruse um, the chat. I, sorry, I could say from Group A. Donna, um, thank we you. We had that discussion about how sometimes in the third space, you have the privilege of moving between groups and translating and bringing knowledge from other parts and sharing it and acting as almost like a carrier between different groups mm. where you can share things. So it's a position of privilege, but it's it was also underappreciated. And maybe the pandemic has raised awareness of how much skill is required. Yes, hello. Um, hi. I, I, I've joined you from Edinburgh, which actually is another benefit to me is that I didn't know things like this existed. So now I can join you. Oh, thank you. And there's a YouTube channel that I might, Colin might put the um, put the link to in the chat where all these are recorded and then you can come back and view at leisure. Um, so thank you. Di, you were looking at the chat. Was there anything that you wanted to raise? Yeah, um, yeah, I was. Uh, I've been putting some comments in the chat. So uh, if anyone hasn't been keeping an eye on it, it is worth a look. Um, there's some really nice deep debates going on there. I just wanted actually to pick up on a, a comment that um, Donna made, which is the idea of privilege um, and that we are privileged working in the third space. It can feel horribly challenging and it can feel um, incredibly demanding. And as Kate said in the chat, it can also involve emotions and working with emotions that can be quite tricky, both the emotions of the people we work with and in fact our own emotions, um, because it is a, a space where identity is fluctuating and where lots of things can happen. But it's also a privileged space to move between. Uh, and I think that point that Donna made is really quite key. And it's one of the things I think we should celebrate more than we do. You know, we're really lucky. It's very exciting in that space. You know, we're not stuck somewhere. We're actually in the midst of things. Um, but I'm a bit of a positivist, so I don't mean positivist in social theory terms. I'm a positive person, uh, so I tend to sort of pick that up anyway. Uh, I'm not going to say any more about the chat because I'll probably pick up some of the things that came up in, uh, in my section, which is coming up shortly. So thanks for um, pulling everybody out of that, Sally. That was great. Thank you. No, thank you. I just note that um, Margaret from Group 7 has um, gone back to William Gibson and said the future is already here. It's just not evenly distributed. And there are um, great examples and that leveraging those and setting that ethos and tone from the top. But no one's non-agentic in this space. Sorry, that's my law double negative coming out there. Everyone is agentic, so it doesn't matter where you are. You can influence from whatever position you occupy, I think. And, and much as Di just said then, from the privileged space to some extent of, of being in the centre of it, um, and we've got to shake up our institutions around this. And something like tonight has been great. So thanks for that, um, validating that for us, Donna. So we might move on to Di, who's going to talk about career trajectories, please, Di. And then there's another opportunity to chat. OK, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about career journeys in the third space, because this is one of the things that when we were talking with Colin before the session, he said was something that he thought people would be interested in thinking about. Um, and we've got a section in our book, and, and we're not really in this bit meant to be promoting our book, but I'm going to mention that anyway. We've got a section in our book which is really about careers in the third space. And there's some really nice accounts and reflections from people who work in the third space about their career journeys. So if you're someone who's thinking, is there a career in this third space? You know, I'm caught in the middle here. I'm in this boundary land. Is there a really a career here or am I kind of stuck? Um, and I would say that's in many ways a rhetorical question because yes, there is a career in the third space. And I think some of our writers in the book and some of the writing that's written out there highlights some of the exciting careers that are in the third space. Uh, and I'm going to actually mention Natalia, who's in the room here, uh, worked by Natalia um, with her colleague, um, of Ellis and Carter, they talked about um, shifting from the idea of a career ladder for third spaces to thinking about a, a career frame and that many people in the third space actually do a lot of sideways moves 
in their journey in in their careers and, and i'm really interested in that kind of thinking about those sideways moves and you may yourselves recognize that and by all means put things in the chat as we go you don't have to wait while the discussion point that we're going to have shortly you can comment all the way through it's always interesting but i think that idea of a frame and and thinking about for yourselves what that frame might look like and being flexible about that is one of the key ways to think about managing a career journey in the third space and for me that's been very helpful that concept of the frame my own career journey through third spaces was uh, in no way straight uh, and definitely had lots of sideways moves and sometimes had um, huge jumps uh, up and down and around so um, in a way I can look back now and frame it but it wasn't so easy in the process so it's, there's some interesting things about what might a journey be like in these spaces and in this boundary land but it, there's some other things I want to think about about how you manage it one of the chapters in the book by uh, Jenny Lawrence she actually creates the idea of a manifesto for thriving in the third space. And, and it's well worth having a look at that at some point if you're kind of trying to make sense of where you are. But she highlights a couple of key things in that manifesto. She talks a lot about values and the importance of values in your career journey and following your values to make your choices in your career. And I think those who seem to have been quite successful in working in third spaces and moving in and out of that space between have often found that that is most effective when they're connected to their values and when they make choices in relation to their values and that can sometimes mean not going upwards so going back to the idea of a ladder but actually moving sideways and thinking somewhat differently about what might be the next best step and not taking an automatic process of, oh, well, it's got to be this next step because that's the next move upwards. I think we have to be brave and interested in, in all sorts of things to really be effective at moving through the third space roles and activities. One of the things that um, I've been interested in for quite a few years and have talked to a lot of people about, and in fact, done a little bit of research around, is the reward and recognition routes and markers that people look for when they're thinking about careers in the third space. Um, and in the UK, there are some fairly clear ones. I mean, I think in many ways we're quite lucky for this. There are several very clear ones that although they're often attached to teaching roles, are actually available to people in professional roles and can allow some real crossover and can be very, very rich for those who are in third space. So those are, those are things like, um, the UK National Teaching Fellowship Scheme, uh, which is um, a, a, an award uh, that's competitive. So you can go for it and be unsuccessful. But one of the things that one of the writers talks about in the book is that going for it and being unsuccessful is not necessarily the negative that it sounds, because the reflection that you go through to apply for an award can often give you a much clearer sense of where you are in your career and where you might want to go next. So there's some real fact, and Lawrence talks about that in, in her thinking about the manifesto for thriving in the third space. She talks about the idea that those reflections that we make as we apply for things, be that jobs, be that reward um, recognition. Um, so things like if you go for um, PSF, uh, PS, uh, you, um, PF, PS, oh, I can't speak today, principal fellow of the, uh, Academy, you, I'm, I'm Higher Education reason. Academy, PS. Thank you, Sally. I, I actually mentor people for that and I just suddenly lost the words. I think I'm distracted by the fact that where I'm sitting, I can see out the window and it's snowing. It's snowing and it's almost April here in the UK. That's so unusual. It's like, oh, it's snowing. So I think it kind of distracted me. So to go back to what I was saying, so I think things like the UK PSF, which I know I should call the PSF, given we're currently in Australia, uh, is actually one of the ways that you can recognise and reward your journey and start to think about establishing markers that show that you're committed to this journey and can be used in applying for jobs, but are also hugely important for sense of identity. I mean, I am a PF and for me, that was a huge identity marker and it really helped me make sense of where I was on my career journey. And I couldn't sort of express that more loudly and Lawrence talks about similar things but what she's also talking about is that nature of reflecting as you go for those things a part of making sense of that career frame so it's part of the ways in which we manage our career journeys um, I'm just going to move us on to the next slide because I just want to pull out some kind of key 
themes around the idea of, of careers and the debate in the chat is now all about snowing so i'm sorry i distracted you off on the same distraction i got caught with there were some themes that um we noted uh, in the sort of stories of careers in the book and that i've noted in work that i've done with people talking about their careers in both the third space and in academic and professional settings that i think are quite interesting and, and are really quite relevant to how we might frame our careers and think about our career journeys in the third space and can help us be more positive when the the barriers come up and they're things like values which i've already mentioned but being true to yourself with those values and making those choices around that and and sometimes choosing not to go upwards because of that i can't speak more highly than anything about mentoring getting a good mentor being a good mentor finding a route to mentoring sometimes in the third space the obvious development points are not there there isn't always the right cpd to pick up because you're in a space that's future oriented that's about change quite a lot of the time and there aren't always the right cpds to attach to you know there are lots of qualifications you can go for but there are all over the place and and those those actual specific um qualifications or cpd activities aren't always straightforward but the be one of the best things to really engage with is good mentoring coaching if that was, is a model that works for you and that you can get it but mentoring can work in all sorts of ways and i've been mentored really successfully and hopefully i've mentored others and i think that that is part of the ways in which we continue our values too networks now a lot of people talk about networks in academic careers professional careers third space careers i'm not talking about you know going to conferences and, and introducing yourself to people and and trying to kind of make those connections which for me is deeply painful um but also is quite challenging for all of us i think and isn't is valid and important and worth doing but i'm talking about finding people who you can work with and share ideas with and really build each other up shape each other's identity challenge each other find your way forward i mean i've been involved in a couple of key networks in my career and they are very much part of my life and my journey. And um, Emily is one of those people that uh, was part of a network with me. And it, it was one of the things that led to the book. So I can't speak more highly of the value of networks. Finding reward and recognition markers which are relevant. Now, they're going to be varied. It's going to mean shopping around. If you're very much involved in e-technologies, then CMALT, if you know it, it is worth looking at. It's set up in Britain, but it's actually available. Um, anywhere in the world and is well worth looking at if people don't know about it i can always put some information out there for you about it stepping in and out of different spaces is a really important way to develop your skill sets for the third space scholarship it's often something when we're in roles that are officially professional we're often not encouraged to think about scholarship quite so deeply but i really do think that scholarship is one of the ways that you can work effectively in the third space it gives you a language to work with a variety of different people if you can get attached to research projects or can do research yourself or be part of research partnerships those two can be really strong ways of developing your sense of self and of work, really good third space working and giving you connections that are part of that third space working. Courage and kindness. Um, Kate mentioned emotions earlier on, and I think that this overlaps with the idea of emotions. I think we are, it, it seems a bit touchy feely to talk about courage and kindness, but I think both are so vital for effective development of self and effective support and development of others. And can my last point on themes really before i get you talking to each other um for five minutes or so a bit more in the chat although i see you're already doing so is supporting others on their journeys so we often think about our own careers but for me it's also about well how are we supporting other people but supporting others and fighting for their right to reward and recognition even if you couldn't have it and I say that as someone, and I, I mean, I've mentioned this to people before. I did um, would have li quite liked to go for professor when I worked in a university, but it wasn't available to me. Even though I was on an academic contract, I was working in a central service department and I was working in teaching and learning um, research and teaching and learning development. And although I had a lot of profile that might in some context have enabled me to go for professor, it didn't. It wasn't available to me. 
and that's fine it's another journey now but i'm working i work with various different people to continue to try and think that should be available to people in those roles i'd like it to be available to other people so i'm going to fight for that i didn't get it but that doesn't matter because other people will the future is there and i want other people's careers to be as rich and varied as they possibly can be so it's about supporting others as well as yourself as somebody's put the CMALT details in the chat box, I get excited when I talk about this. You can probably tell. And, you know, uh, my passion comes out a bit. So I talk very fast as well. So I hope that's not been too overwhelming. OK, um, so I'm going to get you to sort of think a bit more focusedly. There's lots of interesting things coming through the chat, uh, but there's a couple of questions here that it would be great to sort of focus some thought into. Um, the first question is about what challenges are there for building a career in the third space. We're going to use the chat box for this, at least to start to start with. I mean, we may use mics if that works out, but it's really nice to give people a chance to think a bit and to respond. And for those of us who are a bit less vocal, I mean, I'm quite vocal, so that wouldn't be me to actually have a voice. And I think the chat box is a great way to have that voice for everybody. So what challenges are there for building a career in the third space? But don't get too caught up in that, because I'd be really interested to know in what's worked for you. What tips, suggestions or learning experiences have you had that have helped you on your career journey or that are helping you on your career journey? Because we're all at different stages of this. I'm ancient, so it's very kind of different from my part of the picture. So I'm going to pick up comments in the box as we go and, and kind of comment on them. I think that's probably going to be easiest. <laughs> Thank you, Donna, for, for the accolade. I'm going to start calling myself Professor secretly. No, I wouldn't. That would be so fraudulent. Maybe I should just move to America where all people who uh, are teaching are called professors and that would really resolve it, wouldn't it? Yeah, somebody said something about um, how you get supported from other people in this sector because sometimes other people outside it don't understand it. Yeah, and that's very much how the network and mentoring model can really work well for third spaces, I think, because people in this space can understand that challenge and they can also understand how it's easy. It's a good idea sometimes to step into a particular space to do some work, to get the experience, to keep building and developing your practice. OK, so people could talk about challenges, turnover in leadership and unstable structures. Absolutely, James. I, I absolutely. Um, that's been one of the challenges I face, too. And but actually, it's interesting. It can also then lead to opportunities because you have to then grab the new opportunities as they come up. I think it's it is indeed a, a challenge for all of us. Higher education is changing all the time. And I think central spaces and professional spaces change faster than academic. And I think that that can be really challenging for us. I think I had something like seven managers over five years or was it five managers over seven years? And it was really challenging. But, the, but indeed, as you say, James, it can create an opportunity if you want to lead and, and that can be challenging. But leading is an interesting one. There was a debate. I don't know if any of you are aware of um, there's a chat that goes on on a UK time uh, Wednesday evening at eight till nine uh, called L, uh, LTHE chat. Um, and it's basically yesterday's was about leadership in teaching and learning. And I think one of the things that strikes me about leadership is we lead from where we are. And actually, that can mean we can be leading from having nobody who will respond, who, who's our first line report that we basically don't manage anyone, but we can actually be leading. And I think those in central spaces lead all the time. We're leading to change things. We're leading in all sorts of subtle ways. We're leading through influence rather than through um, management. And I think that's so important. And I don't think that should ever be forgotten. And even if it isn't always recognised by other people, it's an important part of our identity in the third space. And I think we should hold on to that and recognise it. Lots of lovely stuff in here. Anybody want to pick up a comment on um, by the mic? Because there's so much coming through on the chat box. Anybody want to do any summary? Emily, any thoughts? Yeah, I'm just loving all the things coming through. And, and um, you know, I think we need to really explore this idea of a career frame and give people some possibilities and pathways to navigate that. But it seems to me that we try and describe what we do and we should be talking in terms of how we do things um, and the way that we do things and it just reminds me of what Stephen Fry said um, a, a while ago he said I'm 
I am many things. I have many identities. He said, I, I, I'm not an actor. I'm not a, a you know, a, a reader or writer. He said, I, I act, I write. So I think we, we lead, we, we write, we speak, we reflect. And, and we should really be talking about what we do in terms of verbs rather than nouns. And I think that um, that, that, that will help in, encourage that visibility. And so going for recognition in, in any way that we possibly can. And that's what we wanted to do, um, particularly in bringing out these narratives. And narrative analysis has been a hugely important thing for us in the book, is to be able to actually really really pin down um, some of the, the, the critical things that, that embrace how we work and how we affiliate um, and I think that's it's that relational thing again so um, somebody mentioned before the the importance of re reading um, sorry reviewing job descriptions and and also about you know leadership possibilities and I think really if we can capture um, the, the the action orientation behind what we do um, and, and get that into job descriptions it will be really important um, so we have it's not just a list of things um, it's a list of tools for doing how we do because actually when I mentioned before the third space is about application and impact it isn't about what we do it is how we do it for sure yeah. thanks um, I mean I think we're now at 9.57 um, so I wonder if we should uh, go to at least the conclusion slide Pete feel free to keep putting comments in the uh, comments box there's lots of interesting stuff out there I've uh, commented on at least one or two just by typing um we just wanted to kind of come to we've only had an hour and we could honestly uh, emily and i could probably talk about this for three days um and we'd get more and more excited and you'd be kind of overwhelmed by us probably um however we really have to come to an end of this session and in a few minutes we're going to um, talk about um launching the book but before we do uh, we just wanted to kind of give you a chance of thinking about any final thoughts or any final questions uh, the quote on here is from uh, julie hall who wrote the um, first uh, chapter in the book um, for us about leading in the third space uh, and i think it's really nice because it's a challenge on both sides really uh, university leaders should call on the boundary crossers to help navigate through the post-pandemic reimagining of the university and so that's it's up to managers to do stuff but but it's also up to us and third space professionals should seize the opportunity and I think that's not easy I don't in any way think it's easy but I think it's exciting and I think there's lots of potential in that um okay any other th final thoughts and questions from anybody Emily any thoughts back from you again at the end just to say that, that I think it's immensely important that Julie's um, contributed to the book in the sense that she's a DBC. She's one of the mega champions of the third space in UKHE. Uh, and I think it's really important that we try and, and you know, harness the perspective of, of those colleagues that have broken through those glass walls and those ceilings and have permanently advocated for this space. And that um, that understanding, I think, in the future, I'd be quite keen to, to continue the conversation about what advocacy means in this space. Um, noting that advocacy is really important from those of us that, that have made progress um, and supporting those who want to make progress and, and wants to, to develop a fulfilling career in this space. And I do believe that is possible. We just have to be brave. Yeah, bravery. Yeah, courage. Told you, courage. <laughs> OK, um, well, it's I'm 10 o'clock. So, Colin, we've finished on time. Wonderful. I knew I knew we would. Um, I don't know how I knew that, but um, but we did. Um, I might just make a couple of little closing remarks and and thank both Diane and Emily immensely for um, uh, being part of this. And obviously, we're we're not going anywhere. We'll um have a bit of a chat about the book uh, in a couple of minutes' time. But um, this kind of discussion that I think really brings a lot of value to this community. Um, my head is kind of thinning, to be honest. So processing this, we'll um, try and capture what's in the chat and make that available if everyone's happy with that. Um, I did add another link, obviously. Everyone here, we'd love to have you in the actual uh, Teleadvisors community um, if you're not already part of that group. Uh, I'd also like to thank Sally Kift, who was one of the um, originators of, she sort of, suggested this uh, as an event um, 
And you know, so we've been chatting about this for a few months now. And so I think this has just been delightful. Um, so yeah, thank you. And thanks everyone for coming along. Um, there, there is a recording. And so we will make the recording available in the um, Televisors YouTube channel. So I think the plan now is just to allow people a couple of minutes to um, grab a cup of tea or a beverage or um, you know, a snack or just have a little break. And then we're gonna come back and do a sort of semi unofficial launch of the actual book, which is available today. So um, I might um, let us do that. We come back at um, say five past the hour or 35 past the hour if you're in the middle parts of Australia. I've actually forgotten what we said we were going to do for the launch. Last day. She has the answer to everything. <laughs> Thanks, Dave. <Dana. laughs> this, this is well, exactly you do. what we were going I'm, to I'm do. Afraid. We were going to put the slide up and hope that there were still, it looks like we've still got 25 people around. Um, <clears throat> and so we were all supposed to go and get a glass. I have a champagne glass, but it's got only sparkling water in it. Sorry. <laughs> Um, so if anybody hasn't got any anybody hasn't got a drink to raise a glass with us, I've got water because it's a little early in the morning for champagne. Um, <laughs> I've got coffee, <clears throat> but uh, caffeine you know, charged. You, you can nip and get a drink because it would be nice at some point in the next twenty minutes or so to to raise a glass because uh, Emily and I are so excited about the book coming out and and it's lovely yeah. that we were able to do this session uh, for the tele advisors uh, at a time that the book actually came out. It was a yes on the exact day. So, yeah, so the way we, the the way we were going to run this is we've just got a couple of slides and then we want to see everyone's face, um, but this is the book and it's pretty bloody fantastic, um, and so we were going to just ask um, Emily and Diane a couple of questions and then let anyone ask what or chat or ask whatever they would like. And so we thought we might start just by asking um, how did the book come about. What, why now or why, as you said, in the pre-COVID space, why, what prompted you to bring all this together with its 22 co-authored um, authored chapters, some of some about 26 authors I think we've discussed overall? Absolutely. Di, do you want to go first? No, you're going to go first. Oh, okay, no, nice, nicely, nicely deflected there. Um, gosh, we've we've had this conversation for so long, and um, we we were talking about it for at least a couple of years before we put pen to paper. Um, and we we had a wonderful meeting with the marvelous Sally Brown, who encouraged us that that this was an idea and that that we should go for it. So we did. Um, and it's just um, I would like to give a massive shout out to our chapter authors for for doing this, for for doing this during COVID, um, and you know particularly when everything was disrupted and and everybody stayed with us uh, and and wrote their chapters and kept to time. It was just wonderful and. Um, it's an honour to be able to, to hold their perspectives and to showcase their work um, in an edited collection. Um, the way in which it came together, I think, has, has bowled us both over, hasn't it, Di? The way that, that um, the chapters have knitted together so marvellously, given that none of us have really been able to meet one another. Um, and we're just really excited for, for our chapter authors to, to read it um, because they haven't yet and to, to see how it fits together and for, for obviously for, for other colleagues to read. We just hope it resonates. Um, based on today's discussion, I'm sure it will. Um, but we are going to be launching a blog, aren't we, Di? Do you want to talk a bit about that? Yeah, well, um, we one of the things that we discovered when we were putting the book together um, was that there are so many stories out there that want to be told about third space working. Um, and we, we I, I could tell you uh, some horrible stories about us trying to cut it to the word count with 22 chapters. Um, and it was one of the, the big challenges that Emily and I had was getting our 22 chapters to fit into the word count they'd given us. And we kept having to ask them for a little bit more words. And to be honest, we could have put in another 10 chapters easily to cover other areas of work and other interests and other evidence. There's so much going on in the third space and there's so many interesting practices and practices 
practitioners doing interesting work and we realized we'd missed people out and we'd missed roles out and we'd missed key activities out that really we should have included so we had this idea that this is the beginning of a conversation not the end and and the book's got recommendations in it and we want those recommendations to lead to action really and to positive outcomes i mean somebody said that they thought the session today was positive and that's great because that's where we feel we are we want to be positive about the future of the third space and about the work we do and how we can impact on universities so we decided so sort of long ramble really we decided that we wanted to keep the conversation going so one of the ways we thought we could do that is to set up a blog that would give us a chance to get some of the people who should have been in the book to write us a piece about their experience of third space or their working in third space or their research on third space um, and that's exactly what we're going to do so for example one of the first people who's going to write for us in the um when we set when the blog's published initially which will be soon and we'll say a bit more about that in a minute uh, is a librarian because we'd realized that one of the people one of the people's roles that really does have an impact in third spaces is those who work in library sector and we hadn't include we hadn't got a chapter from someone in that area um, but that's not the only area and it highlighted for us that several areas are underplayed even if they're in the book so there's lots of things to write about so that's what the blog's about in one sense the other thing it's about is it's a chance for people like us to get together and go oh we're in the third space what can we do and we'll put resources up and we'll invite conversations and, and connect it with twitter um, so it's because we don't want to stop the conversation, really. Absolutely. It's been great um, chatting to, to Matthew Lawson, who's our director of library services uh, um, at, uh, at Middlesex University in London. And he's been a passionate advocate of the book since I told him about it. And um, he has um, really uh, positively said he would write um, for us. And I think that's great. Um, but as Di says, there are tons of perspectives. So I have put my email in there. Um, please do drop me a line. I'll try and get back to you as soon as possible. I'm at the office this afternoon, but um, we are compiling a list of contributors at the moment and we are going to put together some resources um, I think there are some really um, really great stuff going on we want to be able to, to push your work forward in whatever way we can um, and, uh, and inspire others that don't yet know about this space and, and perhaps um, haven't yet had the opportunity to explore it so thanks and we are that. yeah sorry both. I was just so going Sorry, Sally, that was me interrupting. No, we just we've got a, a second slide and we we did have a second question. But Di, you wanted to say something? Uh, no, it was just to pick up on the fact that that we're aiming to launch the blog at what will be our kind of more official launch. Um, which is likely to be early May um, and we will kind of put something out to uh, the teleadvisors group on that when that's going to happen in case you're interested in participating it will be online so it will be possible for people to participate um, and at that we hope that you'll get a chance to meet a lot of the authors uh, we were lucky enough to have two of the authors in the session today um, Donna Murray was in and uh, Will Carey was in although Will was very quiet perhaps he was having problems with his uh, no he's, he's, he on, he's on he's on the early. train he's on the train so he's actually traveling somewhere so he did say to us earlier die that he he wouldn't be yeah. participating Participating, but he's he's been and Sue Beckingham's been with us as well. She's been in and out oh, too. Sue was. So. Yeah, so she yep. was there at the beginning. Yeah, yeah. Yes, so three of our authors were in the room, but we really want people to meet them because they're the ones who wrote a lot of the material in the book. So um, they will be at our kind of core launch when we uh, do it, and we'll let you know when that's going to be. So that sorry, that's the end of that, Sally. So you can continue. No, that's no, that's fine. We just had another. This is Colin's question. I thought it was a great question. Um, the, the question was, did you learn anything surprising as you cu create, curated and, and wrote the chapters? Um, and I had just have to say, it is just fantastic. I was lucky enough to do a review, as you see there, and there's been a great review just published on Wonky. I'll find the link to that, or someone will, and put it in the chat also if anyone's interested. Um, very carefully curated, and, and Emily and Diane both write an overview for each of the four sections, which just adds another rich layer. But did you think, did you find anything surprising? Anything that you didn't know and you, or a new way of thinking about anything? Great question. Did I go first? <laughs> you, I knew you'd throw it at me first. 
Um, well, I, I mean, I feel that I, I was fairly naive about uh, third space. I kind of thought I understood it and was, you know, working. I'd been working in it most of my career and, you know, thought I, I was au okay fait with everything. And uh, I guess I wasn't. Um, that That's probably not a great surprising thing for me to have learned. There was so much out there and so many kind of roles and activities and ways of working that I hadn't even thought about being third space. You know, I'd, you kind of often, however much you're working in a cross boundary role it's still easy to finish up just thinking about your own part of that role um, and I'd been an educational developer so I guess I understood that aspect of third space best of all I guess um, but and I, but I don't, I'd worked with people in all sorts of roles in my in my career um, but I, I kind of hadn't really thought about some of the interesting stuff I hadn't thought about um, knowledge transfer staff who, who work in um, with industry to try and connect universities to industry for research projects and teaching projects and, and all sorts of other uh, development activities entrepreneurial development and I hadn't really got my head around the fact that actually that's third space universities are phenomenal places doing phenomenal work outside of the things that we assume that they do and, and it's it was incredible. I mean, I think I just learned so much about university, but I thought I already knew, you know, and I wasn't an inexperienced person about university sector. I've worked independently for quite a few years and, and knew a lot about it, but suddenly to find out all this stuff. So, I mean, that's not very really profound, but it, it really kind of blew my mind and blows my mind almost on a daily basis. What about you, Em? Same. I learned a huge amount about myself. Um, it was a very cathartic exercise in the sense that um, it was reflection on action and inaction. And we talk about reflective paradigms in the book, don't we, Di? Um, somebody mentions communities of practice before. Um, and it, it's, a, yeah, it's a continual process of, of reflection and, and um, reading others' reflections and then reflecting again. Um, it, was, it was deeply cathartic at a time of, of immense stress and pressure. So um, I started my job. Um, something like two months before the pandemic, um, new university, new role. Most of the relationships uh, my, with my current colleagues have been built online. Um, and I'm sure it's the same for many others too. Um, and yesterday we had a, a leaving due for a, a, a wonderful colleague. Um, and I met so many colleagues that I've been working with for the past two years who I've not yet met in person. It was just delightful to see them. And um, it's, it's, it's very strange how we develop these networks and relationships and, and how we, we, I'm really interested in the idea of, of, of relational capital um, and then applying it to relational pedagogies um, because I do believe this is exactly how we should be working with students and Will and Mars um, in their chapters have been talking about applying the third space with students. There's been a, a huge amount of, of work done on student engagement and student leadership but um, looking at how this works in third spaces is is really critical particularly given the um, the the the, the wide scale shift to um, online uh, and technology enhanced pedagogic practice. Um, and I think um, there is all, an awful lot that we can do around, you know, mainstream pedagogical concepts, assessment, learning design, um, academic practice, everything that we do impacts in some way on the students as well as our colleagues. And I think that we need to really just um, explore that in more detail. Uh, and and it's, it's unpicking those layers of the onion. Um, and actually, the, the more we explore this, the more questions we have um, more questions and answers perhaps um, and the more we explore this the more we know we don't know at least that's a, certainly my experience um, so yeah it's it's just wonderful to to be continuing the conversation in many ways our work will never be done yeah I mean I've also been surprised how appreciated the book has been even before it's really got got onto bookshelves although i have to say several people seem to have already received it and we haven't had our copies yet and it's published today which is very sad i've got a kind of um a, a copy on uh, on my computer which is the the last edited copy with our errors uh, corrections on it and that's the only version of it we've got so those of you who've got it you are so lucky. Routledge have been really snotty with us about sending it out. So got your copy last Friday. Thank you, Yvonne. That just rubs in the salt into the wound. And um, oh, yeah, I just one other thing about Share it. Share the love. I think for me, 
for me, it's just that interest. I, you know, I mean, I thought it was important. It's important to me. It's important to people I work with. Um, you know, Emily and I have talked for a long time about how important it is. But actually, wow, it is. People keep saying how important it is. So we're very excited. And we're really glad that all our authors have had a chance to get their voice out there. So when you read the chapters, you'll, you'll really enjoy engaging with uh, our different authors. There's some, some really inspiring chapters in there. So Colin, we might take the slides down now so we can see who's who we've still got in the room. Thank you. Um, and thanks, thanks to those who have stayed. Uh, it's very, it's I just, it's just amazing. Oh, look at you, Emily, <laughs> with your cup of tea. Um, yes, it's, I'm trying it's, to make sure the cat doesn't disturb me. She's milling around somewhere. She will probably. She loses patience very quickly. That one. So if you've got I, cameras, I, folks, do put them on. It'd be nice to see you. Because we've still got about 24 people in the room. That's great. Um, so there thank is, you to everyone for coming along here. Uh, Colin, I'll hand back to you. I was just going to say in the um, top right corner of the screen, you've got an option to go to gallery view. So that might be a way to see more people. Oh, um, thank you. Some only displaying two people at a time for me, so hey, you know. <laughs> yeah, I've got four, but I can keep flicking between you all. So I've got nine, so there. Yeah, yeah I've well, got nine too. So I'm, let's I'm just sure. Top trumps. Third space top trumps. There you go. And maybe that's how we can can do the compare and contrast and put some points against the things that we do. That would be good, wouldn't it? <laughs> <laughs> so Joanne Caldwell's put a plug in for the journal um, there in the chat. That's great, Joanne. Thank you. And I found I eventually found the wonky review. Um, I don't know. That's how you pronounce it over there, but that's how I pronounce it, it is, in my head. So that's what definitely, out. definitely wonky. Definitely. <laughs> Thank you. Definitely wonky. Um, also, um, Mary Stewart's article was published alongside the book review. Um, those of you that don't know Mary, she's the former vice chancellor of the University of Lincoln here in the UK um, recently. Um, uh, step down from that role and she's argued a lot about um, the importance of recognizing um, fluidity and permeability in the academy and this week she wrote about the importance of looking at, at um, challenging the, the concept of how universities are staffed um, in, in a rapidly changing university environment and so I think um, I really would encourage you to read that. Um, Sam in particular you were talking about a, a conversation coming up with your colleagues I think Mary's article might be particularly useful for you um, if you haven't already seen it or read it. No and it's really useful we had an away day on Monday um, and it was really weird being part of the faculty management advisory group with very senior people which was a bit odd but brilliant yeah it really was that kind of that fluidity the, the bit between professional and the and the academic side but also the bit between the research and the teaching on the academic side and that actually all three of those things kind of need to be a bit more fluid but you know there's a lot of talk about the movement from academic to professional services but there's kind of very little or nothing the other way round. you know there's not that support for kind of professional stuff doing stuff in, in kind of the academic space i mean i got lucky with my last paper because it was a ucat um to work Thanks, Em. Um, and I had a lot of support, but otherwise doing, you know, and it was probably, you know, doing anything is incredibly difficult, a scholarship in a PS space. And getting kind of recognition for that. And certainly in the UK, if you're a PS, you know, you can do amazing research, but it doesn't count towards the ref because you're not recognised as a researcher because you're not on a research contract. Um, yeah, it's, it's interesting. Even, even just a bit of support would be lovely research if you're in that third space um yeah i think you're absolutely yeah, right I mean, um, it, it, yeah sorry emily i was just going to say there's a real there's a real potential and i suspect there are groups out there that are supporting each other across different institutions to do research in in those sort of professional settings so i think you're absolutely right it's very difficult i mean i think sometimes the easiest way is to work with a, a research team that's established 
already and do and be part of that rather than trying to do it alone um but and that's not ideal because it doesn't always give you the the profile that you want or give you a chance to work on what you want to work on um so i mean i think the the idea of networking around that is a, is a real has real potential you know i think we probably need to think about who who to put people in touch with and connect with and, and get a group doing that really um yeah we should think about that emily because i think that is really it's one of the things that i was aware when i was reading rereading some of the chapters recently that um someone was saying something about how much it had helped them develop their third space role from a professional setting getting involved in research and i was thinking i knew how hard it was you know and if you've got an academic contract then there is some hours al allocated to it usually even if you don't always get those hours in reality because the, the work is different but there's an acknowledgement of that it's interesting samantha that you say you know it doesn't count to the ref actually if the university is canny it does I had a friend who was head of student counselling and she'd published several books and they were forever saying to her, we want to include you in the ref um, because actually it benefited them to include her. So, you know, I think that universities, some universities get canny on this and realise it is those people doing research outside of the, um, the structures that they've all set up around research can actually give them benefits. So if you get a good enough profile, they'll be, coming, they'll be knocking at your door. I agree. I think one um, of the things that we can actually do in this um this kind of community is support other in participating in research. So obviously, we've got a mixture of academic and professional staff, so academics are able to launch research. And I don't see any reason why we can't have collaborations across countries or across institutions where professional staff get to be part of the process and, and learn a little bit about research as well. Um, and then, you know, get a few um, runs on the board. That's it. That's your next goal then, Colin. Absolutely. <laughs> of of I, many. I so would... I'm just conscious of time. Oh, sorry. No, that's fine. Go on. I was just going to say um, whether we are going to charge our glasses and um, celebrate yeah. the, um, the launch of the book. Um, so I do encourage people to do so. Um, yeah. Huzzah! <laughs> I don't know what we do. She launched. Congratulations. Launched down under. Yes. Thank you. For bringing Thank you so together. much for your support. <laughs> it's not about all who's sailing her. Anyway, mm. to the book, <laughs> anyway. Good ship, third space. <laughs> to the book. Yeah. To Good the book. spaceship. Well, um, I, well, I have to say those emojis are going to be with me forever, Sally. I mean, <laughs> fantastic. I do my best. <laughs> Absolutely brilliant. Um, oh, look, and Donna's I, done the right thing. She's put emojis in the, and Penny has. Now we're going has, emojis yeah. in the chat. That's yeah. great. Thank Started you. something here. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah, you see, that's an advantage of collaborate. You can put emojis in, can't you? Mm. I don't know that that's true in all these. Uh, on, I don't know if you can do it in Teams, well, someone, <laughs> which everybody in the UK seems to be using. Sounds like they're popping a bottle as well. And people have said um, how energised they felt off the back of this as well. So thank you for that as well. Yeah. Well, right. thank you for sharing it with us. Thank you for having, you know, you. being here on the day. So it's very, particularly given that we haven't got the book yet <laughs> in our houses, it's very yeah. nice to actually share it with real people. Yeah, I feel like I've been transported to today. Yvonne, or is it electronic? Because if you've got the book to hand, Yvonne, you can wave it. If you haven't, then I guess if you've got uh, it electronically, because you said you've got it. Yeah, I do have it. It's downstairs. I can run and get it if you like. <laughs> it's nice I to see you. No, I'll go. <laughs> <laughs> that would be a nice way to close. To wave the book be. would be a nice way to close, wouldn't it? It would be. Um, I feel yeah, like I've been nice transported to today back to, back to the, the little room in Manchester where we wrote the book. Well, I wrote the book during lockdown. Um, the the bits of the book that that I led on, um, and uh, yeah, just interesting. You know, thinking through the the journey, it's been lovely. Yay! Hi. It does exist. Yeah, it's lovely. Thank you, Yvonne. That's a treat. Thank you, Yvonne. That's lovely. <laughs> a real book. That's so nice. 
Well, thank you, everybody. Right. I think we actually are one minute from half past and we said we'd finish at half past. I'm really proud. We've been spot on timing here, folks. So thank you, everybody, because it was so lots of conversations going on. It's always hard to keep to time when it's a, a topic that you're enjoying. Um, and I've enjoyed talking with you all. Thank you so much to thank both of you for visiting. Tremendous presentation. Thank you, Sally. Thank you to everybody. It's been wonderful. Thank you, Colin, Sally, Penny, Hank, for you know helping facilitate this conversation and for the you know early early drafts of the thinking. It's been wonderful. Yeah, Lovely to see people well. that I know and and don't yet know and will hopefully be colleagues for life. So really great. Thank it was you. nice to see your face, Donna. All it really was. It was you look about 10 years younger and uh, with your long hair as well. So that's good. <laughs> this, is, this is what happens in lockdown. You don't cut your hair. It's fine. It just Very grows. True. Very true. <laughs>